to the ends of the earth for the glory of your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And as you're seated, turn your Bible, your copy of God's Word, to the book of Genesis. Genesis, first book of the Bible, and we'll be looking at chapter 25. Genesis 25 today. If you need a Bible, we have Bibles that are available in the foyer. So please pick one up. You can go grab one now and, and rejoin. It's, we'll be jumping around a number of passages this morning. Um, also, if you have children and you didn't already know this, they can be dismissed uh, age three and four. We do have a junior worship and they're invited to, to go participate with that. Um, Genesis 25, uh, verse 19. This is a continuation as we've been studying the book of Genesis. We've been seeing the life of faith, the journey of faith, and now we come to an, another important chapter and another important transition as we see God's plan and work moving forward. Genesis 25, starting in verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be, or, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other; the other shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was six years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name is called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die of what use is a birthright to me. Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray together with me? Heavenly Father, you have chosen us. You have, you have sent your son to redeem us, Father, and then now we ask that you would continue to feed us. Father, that you would strengthen us spiritually, you would use us for your purposes, and you would change us according to your plan that we would be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And so do that work now as we look in your word, Father, do that spiritual work. It can only happen as your spirit bears witness with our spirit what your word is and your call. And so, Father, we ask for you to do that spiritual work as we come to your word right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have you ever wanted something that other people said that you couldn't have? Ever wanted something so bad that you just thought about it all the time? Couldn't get your mind off of it? Or maybe something that you thought that you could never get, and it just kind of just outside of reach. There are many things that we want in this life, and just to mention some spiritual ones, uh, relief from anxieties, strengthening against addictions, that feeling of love, hope in the midst of trials and suffering, hope with extreme loss, or then there's the assurance of God's forgiveness, the confidence that he's forgiven us, even when we think we can't be forgiven. We want to know God's love. We want to know that he's with us in trials. Now, maybe people have told you that you can't have some of those things, and maybe we've thought that we are beyond forgiveness, or we are even beyond God's love. We may not feel lovable. 
Maybe we really want God's help for what we're facing, but he seems so distant. Is it even possible to know this love of God? Now, these are spiritual matters. There are things that, that they, they are uh, gifts that come to us in having a relationship with God. But there, there's a whole segment of our world that doesn't value a spiritual life with God. There are voices that say, oh, you don't need that spiritual stuff. That's for weak people. You can do it yourself. Just if you have enough willpower, if you have good enough habits, if you have good enough goals, if you put enough effort into it, you'll be all right. Now today we want to consider how we pursue God, even in the middle of a world that says those things, even says that God doesn't matter. That brings us to Genesis 25, 19, and it's the birth story of Esau and of Jacob. And we see as, as we read through it, it's a story of Jacob wanting something for all of his life. We get a picture of it, something he can't get off of his mind until he finally gets his hands on it. On the other side, it's the story of Esau who had so much going for him, but yet had little regard for the things that God had given to him. There's an important lesson for us, a spiritual lesson for us in this. Is the promises of God come to those who seek them and pursue them by faith? The promise of God will be missed by the world. The promise of God may be devalued by the world. But they are gained, they are secured by those who pursue them by faith. So let's look a little bit at the background of the story. And it starts off by showing us two parents who really very much want their own child. But yet they can't, they can't conceive. Isaac and Rebecca's story is like Isaac's parents, Abraham and Sarah. They dealt with long periods of, of infertility until God finally answered their prayer. And here you have Isaac and Sarah. Isaac's 40 years old. Sarah's wife's around the same age, and they can't have children. If you jump down to verse 26, you'd see that it lasted for 20 years. It took them 20 years before God answered that prayer. You can only imagine the heartbreak and difficulty and the stress they had during that time, but God did answer that prayer. Now, even though he answered the prayer, as you can see, it wasn't always easy for Rebecca in pregnancy. Any woman who's uh, born children would know and agree with that. It appears that she had some extra challenges that are here because at one point she even regrets her prayers to get pregnant. And she cries out to God, and God reveals something to her. God reveals something that her eyes couldn't see, that there are twins that are within her. There was a conflict. Two brothers were growing up in there, and they were living in that conflict even within her womb. It was really a picture of what was to come. Anybody here have a brother that they fought a lot with? You know, this, this one started way back even when they're in their mother's womb. Well, the Lord, he does. He gives this prophetic vision to her in this, and that there's going to be uh, a, a, a reordering of priority for God, and that the younger is going to serve, uh, that the older will serve the younger. Usually it's the other way around, right? Usually the younger serves the older, especially in traditional families like this, traditional cultures like this. But here the, the older will serve the younger. We're going to get back to that in a minute. The day of the birth, when it comes to that, that has its own particularities. If you have children, again, you probably remember some of those special events, the, those first observations of the child um, as they were, they, they were born. You know, the observations here, Esau, who was born red and hairy, that's how he got his name. And what do we notice about Jacob? Uh, when Jacob was born, he's born clutching his brother's heel, right? Probably had his hand over his head or something like that as he was born. But it was a picture of what would describe his life. Even though he was born second, the, the, um, his father's heir being before him, here he has his hand up, wanting to have what his brother had just gone out had. He'd be scheming, reaching for something that wasn't his at the time. Now Esau here is the firstborn, and as a result, he would naturally receive his father's inheritance, his blessing. Um, he would be the... Um, it was called his birthright, right? We would assume that many of the, God's promises of the land, of a promised seed, would also come through this 
this birthright, which was given to him. But beside that, Esau had some other advantages in his life, and you could see those. He was, you know, he might be called what we say is a, a man's man, right? I mean, he was a good hunter. He liked good food, right? He was strong, powerful, and, and he really had his father's favor in all of these things. You know, Esau is the kind of person we'd be impressed out on the sports field. We'd be impressed with his, his, his uh, energy, which he brings to everything, with the potential that's there. Now, Jacob, on the other hand, well, the Bible describes him as one who lives in tents. It describes him as a quiet person. It doesn't necessarily mean that he was just a homebody, but he didn't have the interests of Esau. Maybe he was more into business. Maybe he was more in education, something that kept him even productively inside of the tents and quiet, maybe more of the introvert. Now, I'm just going to say this as an aside, knowing that Jacob was blessed of God in the end of this story. But it's a reminder to us that the masculinity that God desires is not always a matter of merely external interests. There are a lot of interests that can describe a, you know, a godly masculinity. And so often the world wants to describe some of the homeward tendencies of people as feminine or something like that to the point, even if people don't fit some particular quality of perceived masculinity, that they will question whether they're in a man, whether even a man. Some of the hype about transgenderism today seems to make the mistake that that personality and that, that interests uh, form some sort of sexual identity. Some of the ide di ideology makes it sound like if you have the wrong gender, or you might have the wrong gender if you're a boy who um, likes some things maybe that typically associated with girls or girls who may like some boy things. That's just not the case. We need to realize that God has made different personality types. God has spread around different interests. And those different interests and personalities can be different and yet fully expressive of true masculinity and true femininity without having to question biological sex. We need to accept the fact that genuine masculinity may have different forms without cutting down those forms. What we see here with Jacob, this man that God would accept, is that faith matters. Faith matters dearly, importantly, to God. That brings us back to our main point here, is that the differences mentioned here, are they real, that core, this core truth of Scripture? That God chooses to use who he will use. God chooses to use who he will use by grace. And that God often surprises us by the people he's going to use. Choosing the humble over the proud, even often the weak, over the strong. Now here in our story, it happens in a couple stages. The first of one is in our passage today, in verses, especially in verses 29 through 34. Some sort of time lapse between verse 28 and verse 29. Maybe it's 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. We don't know uh, what it is. But it's long enough that the boys have grown up. The boys are connecting their vocations. They're doing what they do. And then we have this simple story that Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for this pot of stew. Remember, that birthright belongs to him as, in, in these traditional cultures, as the firstborn son. The inheritance would go through him. Covenant promises would normally pass down to him as well, we, we believe. And Esau sells it to Jacob for stew. Right there, humanly speaking, uh, Jacob trades his way, not only the birthright and these promises of God, the, the, the land of Canaan, the covenant, the, 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 the line of God's promised seed. He trades into that, and Esau trades it away. And so this is where, getting to this point, we want to talk about the so what, right? What's the application here? And we want to look at how we experience the promises of God, how the promises of God become ours, and, and as we have them, how do we hold on to them, enjoy them for ourselves? Jacob and Esau, they point to critical answers, and that's what we're going to work out today. Well, the first thing that we see is we need to believe that God's promises are the greatest of all treasures. The differences between Esau and Jacob, they, they, they are striking. I mean, Jacob wants this birthright. 
right from the start. And Esau doesn't seem to care much for it. I mean, it starts with him trying to hold on his brother's feet, even as he's born. It's a, it's, it's a sign of what's to come. And you see it in the opportunism that he has right when Esau's hungry, right when he's vulnerable, and he makes his trade to get that birthright. Now, on the other hand, Esau despised his birthright. Look down at verse 34. That's exactly what it says. He despised his birthright. He didn't value what he had. I'm mean, sure he might be hungry, but would he really have died had he not eaten? I mean, that's a pretty doubtful statement. Maybe he'd been so hungry he thought, I'm starving, right? Don't, don't always say that sometimes, I'm starving. Like, I'm going to die if I don't eat. Um, you know, you get that picture that it's Esau. I mean, he's not going to starve if he doesn't eat this one meal. But he's a picture of a person who really ultimately lets himself be steered by the passions of his own flesh, right? Disregarding the promise of God for his own comforts, his own need of the moment. First John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, it describes it well. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. I'm going to turn there. First John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Now there we go. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with his desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Esau's life is run by the desires of his flesh, by the desires of his eyes. His personal hunger here is more important to him than the birthright that he has been given. You know, even in the kindness of God. In fact, we also see some of the pride of life. You know, pride that he's a hunter. He's sufficient. He's going to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And we get a picture as we read this. It's almost like Esau thinks he's getting a good deal as he makes his trade. But it's a very short-sighted vision. As uh, verse, uh, 1 John 2.17 says, the world is passing away. And so for all this desire that he has for hunger, he's going to get hungry again. And he's going to find another food at another time. But one thing he'll never have again is that birthright. And he'd want it again. If you jump forward to uh, Genesis 27, you'll see he wants that blessing that comes of it, but it's gone. Never to be had again. One of the two passages in the New Testament that describes Esau is in Hebrews chapter 12. If you want to turn there. You can see Hebrews chapter 12 and how it describes something. It gives us a bit of consideration for our own life. Hebrews 12, verse 15. This is where we read there. there. See to it that no one falls, fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Hebrews 12, 16, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Hebrews 12 shows that danger of disregarding the grace of God, the offer of God's grace inside of our lives. We have this promise of forgiveness of sins, the deliverance from the power of sin, you know, to become a new creation in Christ, to be adopted into God's family, to experience his love, to know purpose and joy in following God. And yet would we, like Esau, trade it away for the world? But what do people trade away the grace of God for? Hebrews chapter 12, starting there, verse 15, it shows two things. Two things. The first thing it describes is bitterness. Bitterness would become bitter because something difficult happens in life. And we get mad at God or we get mad at someone else. We think that God has given us a a raw deal. We don't like the way that Christians have treated us or we don't like that some Christians have treated other Christians. We don't like the fact that we're lonely or sick or in a difficult marriage. We don't like that we're struggling financially or that our loved ones have died. And so people become bitter, bitter against God, bitter against others. There's a thought that that bitterness will hurt them. We kind of punish them over and over in our mind by saying that they aren't treating us how we should be treated and they they deserve something bad. There's a lot of truth in the statement that says that bitterness is the poison that we drink 
in order to punish someone else, right? It's a poison we drink to punish someone else. We become angry. We distance ourselves from others. We speak badly about God. We speak other, badly about others inside the church. And it feels like a good trade at first, right? People won't treat me the way that I want. I should be free at least to punish them in my mind, in my heart. It gives me a sense of freedom, vindication from the way they treated me. But what happens? We trade away the grace of God. Instead of being overwhelmed by his love, by his grace, his mercy, the bitter heart gets consumed with hatred, revenge, isolation. Bitterness, as I remember, um, I think C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce describes a woman who's especially bitter. And although she has these great promises of forgiveness and love of heaven, it's that she chooses to hold on to her bitterness all the way into hell. Choosing to hold on to that rather than the forgiveness that God grants. There's another thing that people tray away for the grace of God, he says here, and it's um, sexual immorality, the, the pleasures of sexual immorality. I mean, it is insane to think about how people will throw away their families, even careers, even separate themselves from the grace of God just for a little pleasure from sexual immorality. Depriving children of a healthy home so they can pursue an adulterous affair. How a person can decline to the pits of depravity from pornography use. Or a person will try to fill their loneliness by giving their body away without the gift of marriage. There are other ways that people would act like Esau in pursuing the world and failing to receive this grace of God, the love of money, trading away an uh, active Christian life for convenience, the love of success, pride or anger, the desire for acceptance. And there's people who have done this throughout time. Although having an appearance of being inside the covenant people of God, being inside that church, but yet turning away. Paul had Demas. He loved the present world. He deserted him. Jesus had Judas, disciple for a number of years who traded away his savior for a bag of silver in his own dream. Every generation has its own people who turn away from Christ. If we read the stories of today's ex-evangelicals or those who have deconstructed their faith, you know, it can be very disheartening. It's disheartening to me to read some of the stories. We're reminded, I mean, this is... Something that people have done. Reminded how the Bible said this would happen. In fact, 1 John 2.19 explains a bit of it. 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out. There might be complained that they are not of us. So we're reminded inside of the Bible over and over again that there are those in the visible church who seem to have a part in the covenant of God who will give up the promises of God because they love the world more than God. You know, in the end, they show their hearts are distant from God, that they're holding something out. While they enjoy the covenant blessings of God, they refuse the path of repentance and of faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, you know, talking about Esau, it, it, it warns us. Don't let that be you. Just having this outward veneer of faith. Say, I don't really want to repent and believe. I just want this outward veneer. But rather walking with Christ by faith. I mean, the world and, and, and will not encourage you in this. Don't think that you're going to find encouragement in the world. Frederick Nietzsche said that Christianity is for weak people. Right? And that's what the world will tell you. It'll kind of repeat his phrase, never telling that, that that same philosophy which he led and espoused and said Christianity is weak would be the same philosophy which would lead to the Nazi atrocities. It's a lie. Re reject that lie. There's life that's in faith. Now, when something dominates our heart, we will trade anything to get it. And that's why we have to guard our heart and we have to harbor what it takes over our hearts. 
And people may disregard the Christian faith and they may think that it will make their life easier. But that's not what the Bible says. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 11, verse 28. He gives this wonderful invitation in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. He gives this wonderful invitation to come to him. And it reminds us what he's offering in comparison with the world. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, he says this. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right? He talks about the normal course of life in this world and what the world offers, apart from uh, the, the world in sin, apart from God, apart from God's work in our life and his law, there is, there is a heavy burden. And Jesus offers rest. Then he says this, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke of the world is heavy, but the burden of of but the yoke of Christ is light. Now here's where Jacob stands out. We see what Jacob wanted. We see his heart, it's coming out there. He wanted that birthright, he wanted that grace. He wanted those covenant promises of God, the the land, the future, he took them seriously. And he valued it. And so while he stood outside that birthright, he wanted it and he gained it by faith, right? Looking to what was there, looking to this covenant promise of God and believing in it. Esau not valuing them, valuing them and giving them up in unbelief. What we love, we will pursue. What we love, we will desire. Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 44 through 46. Matthew 13, he gives two parables which describe about the power of our desires and, for the, and the power for the kingdom of God. Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. No cost is too high. No repentance is too great. No call of faith is too much. He wants that kingdom. Or verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who in finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Or and bought that, uh, that pearl of great price, right? Esau, not valuing it. He'll give it away for a pot of stew. I mean, Jacob got a great deal in this, right? But for Jacob, it's faith. For Jacob, it's faith. And after we have this account in Genesis chapter 25, is that their lives kind of go on like normal for at least a little bit, Right? until all of a sudden it hits. Esau doesn't have his birthright anymore. Jacob is gonna get a blessing from his father. That's what Genesis 27 is all about. And it just hits birth Esau. He can't go back, he can't repent, he can't get it back now. And that sometimes happens to us. It's just bit by bit, we slip, we slide a little bit here and there, and then all of a sudden we realize, how did I get where I am? How did I end up losing this thing that was great hope to me? If that's you, if you find that bitterness or sexual morality or something else, some other desire of your heart, you know, is, you know, taking over so much of your heart and your mind and your attention, you know, go back to Christ. Go back to Christ. Know that he is the pearl of great price. Know that he is that treasure hidden in a field. You know, that's where you'll find life. That's where you'll find value. That's where you'll find that those burdens of sin taken away. How do we experience the promise of God? First, to believe God's promises are the greatest of all treasures. Secondly, in light of that, belief sees every opportunity to take hold of the promise of God. You know, Jacob was opportunistic, wasn't he? I mean, he wanted that birthright from the day that he was born. I bet he thought about it every day of his life. And so when this opportunity comes in, he takes advantage of it. He jumps right on it. Isaiah 55, 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Right? Right there, where the gospel is presented, seek the Lord while he is found. It says, call upon him while he is near. What does that mean? If you're wicked, it says, forsake your way. If you're unrighteous, get rid of your thoughts and do what instead? Return to the Lord and then you'll find compassion. Right? And so when Isaiah writes this statement of repentance, he's saying, hey, You know, when you have the chance to do it, do it then. When we think about what we want, we look for opportunities for that thing, right? 
when, when you um, try to buy a house, I mean, you go, I know that people are trying to buy a house. You go all in, it takes all your attention, you find that one. When you're trying to buy a car, you know, it just kind of consumes your thoughts until you get that taken care of. And just by applying our minds to it, it makes us ready for when that opportunity comes in, that presents itself, and then we can go after that opportunity. Spiritually, it's the same way. You know, as we think about the promise of God, we think about the offer of the gospel, we think about our work of obedience and faith. When opportunities come up, we're ready to pursue them. Your prayer life is important. That's why prayer is so important. Right? As you pray, you know, you're presenting these things before God, and God is working your life, changing you and preparing you for the things that are ahead. Sometimes when it comes to sharing our faith, we had the Share Your Faith workshop mentioned earlier. You know, a big part of, of the class also is to pray because when we pray about these things, it is surprising how God brings opportunities to us to share the faith. That happened to me just this week. A prayer. God opened up the opportunity to share Christ. But it's also reading the Bible. Bring in those promises of God so that when you see this opportunity to act on them and respond by faith, that you're, it's already in your mind. You're going to respond because, because those things are part of your thinking, your thoughts. If you're a non-Christian here, you know, my encouragement is read the Bible. Start in Matthew, read through the New Testament, get familiar with it, be familiar with the wonderful promises of God, and know those promises. And so when you have the chance you become confronted with your own sin, when you become confronted with, uh, with a need, when you become confronted with the end of your own resources, is that you see where God answered that in Jesus Christ for you. And so you see when the call to genuine faith and belief comes, you'd understand what it is that you're called to believe and to do. When you have the chance to act on the grace of God, do it. Even if it's now, even if it's today. If you're here and you're not a Christian, I mean, maybe today is the day of salvation for you. It is. Why not believe? It's right there. If you've been thinking about salvation, if you think about receiving Christ, if you're thinking about repenting of your sin, you know, today's the day. You may not have another day. You know what's going to happen to you this week, and you also don't know what's going to happen to your heart. You may not come back next week. Maybe today's the day, and the only day that, you're, that you'd have to say, you know what? I need my sins to be forgiven. I need, you know, I need to be reconciled with God. I need to repent of my sins before they destroy me, before my life ends and there's no more chance. I need to do it today. For Jacob, that was the day to act on it. And for us, as we feel the weight of sin, that's the day. As you know the love of Christ, that's the day. Look at his love, that he would go on that cross to bear the penalty of your sin, that he would take it away from you, and that he would receive you into his own family in love and, and, and embrace you and give you an inheritance which goes on forever and ever in heaven and eternal life. You know, what joy is there in that? And you know when you ask him to forgive your sins, he will. It's your opportunity. Ask God to forgive your sins. Would you have him do that? All right, the third thing we want to see today is to remember that God does not judge like man does. There's a second passage in the New Testament which speaks about Jacob and Esau, and that's in Romans 9. I actually don't have a slide, so turn to Romans 9, if you would. Romans 9, 10 through 15. No slide is coming on this one. We might be inclined, if we're looking at these two brothers, to think that Esau might be a better, or better pick for God. He was a strong hunter. He'd be able to defend the nation better. He'd raise up a, a, um, you know, children that were hunters. But in choosing Jacob, God shows that his promises are made from his grace. They are made of grace, not on the basis of merit, not on the basis of accomplishment, but they are on the basis of mercy. Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 15 show us this. Starting verse 10. And not only so, it says, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, or forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had, nothing, done not, and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, as is written, Jacob I loved. 
but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Verse 16, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So you remember back in Genesis 25, 23, God said that the older would serve the younger. Remember, it's a promise that's made before either of them was born. And as Romans shows us, that was to show that God's salvation is ultimately a work of his sovereign grace, not a result of works. God chose Jacob to receive his grace and then to make his calling and election sure. What did he do? But he gave him the faith to believe and receive those promises. Right? That was part of God's sovereign mercy. That was part of his plan to choose him. And then we see the faith working out in this response to the birthright. And that's a great encouragement. Because we might wonder how God could save us. We might wonder how God would want to save us. I mean, how, how could he save us? Doesn't he know our weaknesses? Doesn't he know my sin? Why would he save someone with my background? Why would he do that? And they were reminded of what it says here in Romans 9. God has mercy on whom he has mercy. He has compassion on whom he will have compassion. We see that before we did anything, God chose to have mercy on us. He knew we'd sin. And he chose to redeem us from that sin. Chose before the beginning of time. I mean, that's how committed to the salvation, to salvation of his elect that God is. He chose to save. He chose to, say, to send Jesus to pay sin. And he cho chose to give us faith to believe. What a wonderful grace. What a wonderful grace. And the evidence of that election then is faith. It's faith in Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, you know, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Your faith is a gift. And it's a reminder how Jesus said that God blesses his people by giving them this childlike faith. In Matthew 11, 25 through 26, Jesus declares, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. God's the giver, even of childlike faith. And so if we're here today believing in God and, and hoping in his promise, I mean, the main thing that we can do is to worship him, to give him praise for his grace. We're reminded that, that it was totally of him, that salvation is his work. And that he blesses those who pursue him by faith like Jacob did. Jacob was not perfect. I mean, there are a number of times that we will see as we read through Genesis, he was deceptive, he was manipulative. And he wasn't perfect, but, but he knew one thing, is he needed God's blessings. Like a child, he sought that promise by faith. And God would change him, and God would use him for the future, and he would use him to show the gospel of grace. And that's what we need. We go to God with our sins. We go to God with our weaknesses. We go to God because we're overwhelmed by his love. And we know that because of what Jesus did, his death on the cross to pay for our sins, that he'll receive us. That's our hope. That God accepts us on the basis of what Christ has done. It's not on how manly or womanly we are. It's not how powerful or how religious or good or righteous we are, but on his sovereign grace, received through faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, th that shuts down pride. But that's something that increases love, that increases our response. If you're here, you're in Christ, you're a holder of God's promises. The world might despise it, the world may not value it. You may know people who have set aside its promises themselves. They show their distance from God. But you know 
in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have the pearl of great price. There may not be anything amazing about you, and you may have some pretty big problems, but you have that pearl of great price. That's Christ. And as you have him, by faith, you took hold of life. That's the promise of the gospel. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are so gracious and you are so merciful to your people. Even though, Father, we've sinned, even though, God, we've rebelled against you, God, you look down on us with grace and with mercy. God, you chose to save us. You chose to send Jesus for us. God, you chose to give us faith. Father, what love that you poured out on us. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would preserve us in that love. Father, the world may dismiss Christ. We may know others who dismiss his work, who set it aside. But Father, help us to treasure it, to treasure it above anything that this world has to offer. God, help us to show our delight when the people around us would also know there's hope for them as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.